Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and a warm welcome to the fourth in the Centre for Army Leadership's webinar series. By way of introduction, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Langley Sharp, S01 Leadership here at the CAL, the Centre for Army Leadership. Indicative of the popularity of our, of our guests today, we are actually over, oversubscribed. So as the, uh, as the platform here fills up, we'll be reverting for the wider audience onto our YouTube channel. We'll be streaming live there as well. For those of you joining us today that haven't seen any of our previous webinars, and this is the fourth we've held over the last, uh, last few weeks. If you want to see our back series, uh, back catalog of those, please do go to our YouTube channel. You'll also see uh, a whole series of speaker, speaker events and our annual conferences hosted there as well. So please do take a look. For those of you new to the CAL, um, Centre of Army Leadership, you will also be able to visit our website. Details will be coming up in a minute in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And there you will find a host of products to support you in your leadership development. Uh, talking about a bit of housekeeping then, those of you not familiar with Zoom, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see two boxes, question and answer box and a comments box. If you want to join in the discussion, make some comments, please use the appropriate box. If you want to pose a question to today's guest, then please put it in the Q&A box and we'll pick them up this end. If you're watching via YouTube, please put your questions in the, the appropriate comments box at the bottom. Format today then, 45 minutes uh, talk, followed by up to 45 minutes of today by W1 Andy Stephen, W1 Leadership here at the CAL. So without further ado then, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's guest, Warrant Officer Class 1, Gav Patton, Army Sergeant Major. Mr Patton, a Cornishman, born and bred, joined the Army in 1997 as a light infantryman and over a career spanning more than 20 years, has seen uh, operational service in Northern Ireland, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He served as an instructor at the Infantry Training Centre in Catterick, as well as two tours here at the Royal Military Academy Sanders, and as Colour Sergeant and the com Company Sergeant Major as well. He later took post as the uh, RSM of the 3rd Battalion, the Rifles, before uh, moving across to the USA. He was the first soldier, the British soldier, in over three decades to attend the, uh, the US Command Sergeant Majors Academy in Texas. On his return then, he took appointment as the first Field Army Sergeant Major, and in November 2018, Mr. Patton was appointed the second Sergeant Major of the British Army. Particularly pleased that he's able to join us here today on, on two accounts. Firstly, uh, be of no surprise, he is a very strong advocate of our soldier and NCO cohort, and he's passionate about developing our future leaders. A passion we share here at the CAL as we consistently push them for a message that leadership is everyone's business, all ranks. And secondly, because Mr. Patton is himself a leader who inspires and influences across all ranks of the British Army. So without further ado, I will hand you over to the Army Sergeant Major, W1 Patton. Welcome. So thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to, to be here today. I'm just going to attempt now to, to share uh, my screen. Bear with me just one second. I'm um, having a technical difficulty already. Uh, Gernot says the host disabled participant screen sharing. Give us uh, one minute, Mr. Patton. We're just looking at it at this end. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hey, uh, so what, while that's going on, listen, let me, um, let me first say thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to come and chat with you all today. Um, I know I've got um, friends from Australia, um, civilian friends, uh, people that I've met, known and work with, um, and also you know, a, a breadth of, of military serving and, uh, and, and not serving. So if you'd have said to me, um, you know, when I joined the army 23 years ago, that I would be uh, a guest speaker on a, a digital webinar um, to over 700 people, um, I would have laughed you out of the room. So uh, this is um, a, an amazing opportunity for me. And, you know, as um, as uh, the colonel mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk about leading through crisis. And, you know, he's quite right when he says 
that I'm passionate about junior NCO leadership and, uh, and, and army leadership. And junior NCOs are the most important part of the army for me at the moment. Um, so you've had a little bit of an update on me and, and who I am. I'm the second um, Sergeant Major of the Army. I've been in the post now for, for just over a year and I'll finish at the end of next year. So um, I'll, I'll do three years in total, which is great. And we have 90 minutes together today to discuss the topic of leading through crisis. And because my passion is junior leadership, I will focus on the junior NCO and why they are so important. The session will be 45 minutes of me leading you through my thoughts, ideas and understanding, followed by 45 minutes for questions and discussions. Mr. Patton, if you want to try your screen now, it should work. Okay, here we go. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, we've got that. Okay, I need... I just want the slideshow to start. There we go. Have you got the full slideshow? Yeah, we're in. Thank you. Perfect. That's great. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. So like I said, this, uh, this session will be 45 minutes of me leading through my thoughts, ideas and understanding, followed by 45 minutes for questions and discussions. But please do use this opportunity to ask me absolutely anything. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't, I'll tell you and I'll get back to you. But my only plea over this next uh, hour and a half is that we shoot straight in here. You know, I'm a, I'm a soldier the same as many of you out, out there listening to, to what I've got to say. So please, please hold me to account and challenge me on anything that you wish. And please remember that I'm still learning too. Um, okay, so a little bit about, uh, about why me. Why have I been asked to come and speak to, to all of you today? Well, as I've heard, you know, I'm the fourth, the fourth person to, you know, be lucky enough to come along and, uh, and, and talk in the speaker series. And um, you've heard a little bit about, about who I am. I just want to, to let you know about some of the stuff that I do. So um, I, if, it was, if you were to put this in, in one sentence, I'm the soldier's voice in the four star headquarters. Um, so CGS, DCGS, ACGS and all the other directorates, they all work in, um, in Army headquarters and, and uh, do things to make things better for, for our soldiers and for our army. And they, they are always asking me, how will, this how will this affect the soldier? How will this impact the soldier? So I am um, a translator, a courier, um, and uh, uh, a translator, a courier and a thermometer. So I'm a thermometer because I measure the temperature of the army. I measure the temperature of the workforce and I tell uh, the, the top of our army when, when things are, are really um, too busy. Um, I'm, a, I'm a courier because I carry messages up and down the chain. So I'll take stuff from CGS and I'll carry it right the way through to the tactical level. Um, but I'm also a translator because some of the stuff that comes out of the, the top of the army, I struggle to understand. Um, and I've been working there for a wee bit now. So I will um, take the uh, strategic narrative and I will um, transform that into something which everyone can understand um, at the tactical level. So um, that's what I see my, my three key things are um, in army headquarters. Um, I also do other things. I work on the medals board. I'm uh, a trustee for a couple of charities, the, the soldiers charity, ABF, um, I'm uh, part of the board of the Union Jack Club in London and like I say I sit on the, the medals board for MBs, OBs etc and, uh, and reading those packs, those citations is, is simply brilliant to see all the good stuff that goes on um, in our army. So what have I done? You've, you've had a, a brief rundown there of what I've done operationally and what I've done training wise um, and uh, you know 23 years in the army, I, I joined the army um, for, for a for three four years um to then leave and, and do something else but um you know it was never my aim to stay in the army forever but actually you know it's kept me busy it's kept me interested and it's kept me in it's given me absolutely everything i've got today so um the army owes me nothing and, and i owe the army everything so uh you know I, i'm having a, an absolutely uh, fantastic time a blessed career and if um you know when it starts to become a job that's when i know that it's that it's time to leave but currently I'm, I'm still loving it. And it's a, a huge privilege to be 
the, the second army sergeant major. Big boots to fill um, from the SEAC, but, uh, but I'm, I'm really, really enjoying it. Um, I think the most important thing I can do is be um, contactable, approachable and available for soldiers. And I spend a lot of my time now certainly virtually talking to soldiers, um, virtual meetings, etc. And, you know, it's really important that I, I still maintain a feel of what's going on in the army because that's what I feed back into uh, to our directors. Why am I here? Well, you know, when I, when I heard about this and the opportunity to talk about, about junior leadership and to, to peddle my, my thoughts and my messages to, uh, to such a, a big audience at one time, you know, I jumped at the chance. You know, like, like was said at the beginning, I am, a, I am massive on, on junior NCOs. Um, they are the first layer of the leadership onion. And ultimately, any order, even given by, you know, a chief of the general staff himself, every order is executed and carried out by a junior NCO. And, and their soldiers. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a great opportunity for me to, to tell you a couple of things that I think and then for you to tell me some things that, that maybe I don't know and I can take away and learn from. So, uh, so that's why I'm here. But I'm not here to, to tell you how to, how to command or lead soldiers. I'm, a, I'm the Sergeant Major. I, I don't command anything. I am a soldier, but I support the people that do and I support the people that are commanded to. But it's important to understand that I do not command um, anything. Um, I've not always got it right and I think that's part of the, the beauty of having a soldier at the, um, at the strategic level is that you know I make mistakes too and there's, there's three messages I, I send to the army all the time you know rank is an opportunity to do more for your people um, not an opportunity for um, people to do more for you and my second one is that soldiers don't make mistakes on purpose and I, I absolutely believe that um, and I've made my fair share of mistakes and we'll go into some of those in a, in a bit more detail in, it, in a little bit. Um, so no, I've not always got it right, um, but I've learned from my mistakes. Um, I don't do strategy. So please, please don't ask me any questions on, on strategy and stuff. That's what, my, uh, that's what my commander does. What I do is, su is support my commander in, um, in some of the decisions that, that he makes and his directorates make. But I, uh, I do not do strategy. And our soldiers would not thank me if I started to talk and act like I knew what I was doing, mixing in three and four star strategy. Um, I've got a, I know a little bit about a lot, but I, but I leave the, you know, the deep subject matter expert of strategy to, to our commanders because that's what they get paid for. I'm a soldier in Army headquarters, I think is how you need to look at this. So I am your voice at any time to pick up the phone, to text, to tweet, to whatever, to whatever it is you want to do to, to get hold of me if you think that I need to hear about something or if, um, or if you can improve the way that I do my business. Um, and the last thing that I think our soldiers want is for me to act like an officer. So that is, uh, that is why me. So what we're going to talk about today is, um, is army leadership. Uh, le leadership in action, leadership in crisis. Um, and what is army leadership? It's the first thing we'll, we'll touch on. Um, we'll talk about the models we use and how it is taught. Uh, we'll then take a, a dive into, into what our junior commanders actually do for our army, how they do it and the impact that they have. Our jersey is next, and what it means to wear an MTP jersey, the shirt that, that all of our soldiers wear today. Um, and I just wanna talk about the legacy and the importance of, of that jersey. And some of you would have heard me talk about it today. I'll also talk about how, um, how important it is to leave your shirt, your jersey, in a better place. Uh, we'll cover the importance of junior leadership in crisis and why every order is eventually executed by a junior commander. And then um, I'll finish off with the 10 diseases of leadership, um, an overview of how we should all hold ourselves to account every day using these 10 tools. And I find them extremely useful. And, uh, and then you can hold me to account and uh, you know, ask me any questions and, and have a discussion. Um, but before we do any of that, um, you know, I think while I've got such a, a wide range of people here, it's really important that you see that the latest that's come out of Army headquarters.
Um, well, hopefully that's uh, it, normally you can gauge the audience and there's a little bit of banter with those, but it's uh, it's it's very different when you're sat behind a computer screen and you can't see any reaction. So so hopefully that you know that uh, that hot information straight from our headquarters is a uh, has, has uh, cheered you up a wee bit. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about what is army leadership. Phil Marshall Slim would say, leadership is that mixture of example, persuasion and compulsion, which makes men do what you want them to do. I would say that it is a projection of personality. It is the most personal thing in the world because it is just plain you. Now, our army, the doctrinal definition of army leadership is, a combination of character, knowledge and action that inspires others to succeed. And me, as the Sergeant Major of the Army, what Gav would say is leadership is the ability to make others want to do what they don't want to do. Um, so there's, there's three, three different versions um, or ideas of, of leadership. But what, what I'd like you to do is to give the following quote some thought. I mean, I read this years ago and it's, uh, it's stuck with me ever since. When the blast of war blows in our ears and the situation is bloody dangerous, you need instinctive, exemplary, innovative and inspirational leadership. Such leadership requires individuals who are not easily intimidated, who display both character and confidence. Your character, your conscience, your principles and your honesty are the basis of your ability as a leader. It's your individuality, your single-mindedness, your integrity, humility, and your desire to be damn good at what you do is important. There's lots of things I pick out of that. And um, it, like I say, it's a quote that I read many years ago and it's, it's still with me today. It's, uh, it's, it's a great quote. Um, so you'll see on the slide a picture of our army leadership doctrine. It is a great handrail for all commanders to follow. And I recommend you all read it and keep it to hand. Leaders are readers, and our soldiers, our soldiers deserve outstanding leadership. They're entitled to it. It is everybody's responsibility to understand how they can best lead and what works for them, and there is certainly not a one-size-fits-all solution. It took me many years, many mistakes, and many different experiences to identify my own leadership style. I want to look back to my own leadership journey, I shudder, and I want others to learn from my mistakes. As an army, we've professionalized leadership. We've stopped guessing and we've written doctrine, although we still don't read it. In an organization where our soldiers, our people, are the most important resource, why do we spend so little time reading and learning the theory of leadership? Let me put it another way. If you're in the Royal Air Force, then it's all about aircraft, the airframe, how it works and how you maintain it. If you're in the Royal Navy, it's all about boats or ships, depending if you are above or below the surface apparently, um, but you wanna know how they work and how to maintain them. But I'd offer if you're in the army, you know, what is it about? Well, I think it's about people. Yet when was the last time you sat your commanders down and taught them how soldiers work, how to maintain them and how to get the best from them? If I were in the room now, I would ask to see a show of hands from all those officers and soldiers who had read our leadership doctrine and the result always disappoints. We owe it to our people to be the best leaders we can be. The people of our great nation are trusting us with their sons and daughters and we owe it to them to be the best we can be. Remember that rank is an opportunity to do more for your people and not an opportunity for people to do more for you. That said, we're far from broken. We've all seen the components of fighting power, the army leadership model and the army leadership code. And I believe that the key to success with all things leadership at any level is to live and apply the values and standards using the Army Leadership Code as a vehicle, all underpinned by discipline. So here you can see the components of fighting power. Uh, what I won't do is, is dig into this because um, this is all, all readily available for, for everyone to see. 
So we understand what those are, conceptual, physical, and moral. We've all seen the army leadership model. So teams, tasks, and individuals. And we all know what our values are, or we should do. C drills, courage, discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty, and selfless commitment. And I think we need to live our lives by this every single day. We have our standards, appropriate behavior, lawful, and totally professional. And just have a, have a read of that, uh, that quote at the bottom there by Field Marshal Rummel. Uh, and then we have our army leadership code and i was at the launch of this uh, maybe five or six years ago and what i don't want this to become is merely something at the bottom of a of an email in a signature block i want us to to, to live by this so i'd encourage you all to make sure that you understand what it is how you use it and how your soldiers use it too so just to refresh the uh, Army lead, uh, so values and standards um, and our uh, Army Leadership Code as the vehicle for delivering our values and standards, all underpinned by discipline. And I think that if you apply all of that to, to all things leadership at whatever level, then you're not going far wrong. Okay, so I'll move on now to, to what our junior commanders do. So Oli Grender said, that the military now talk about the strategic corporal, meaning that in modern day warfare, a corporal on the ground can challenge the overall strategy of the entire campaign. Because whatever that corporal does can instantly appear on the news from an act of heroism to a war crime. Everything is out in the open. And do you know what? I agree with him. And I think we expect a lot from our junior commanders arguably much more now than ever before. I know that when I joined our army 23 years ago, the pace of life was glacial compared to what we see today. The technology was very basic, and the most I had to worry about was ensuring that my Milan post had bottles and batteries, and that I had a ration pack with cheese that wasn't off. Today it's very different, and our junior commanders are expected to do a great deal more. I remember being a young Lance Corporal in Sierra Leone. I was 20. I was terrible, if I'm honest, and nearly sacked, but that's a different story. My job was to sustain water and food. I used a map and a compass to navigate, and my daily checks consisted of weapons, ammunition, and a radio or two, which took me 10 minutes. Fast forward to being a Colour Sergeant Platoon Commander in Sangin on Operation Herrick 11, and my platoon checks were an event. Multiple weapon sites, multiple comms kits, multiple ECM platforms, multiple vehicles, multiple weapon types, all needing different natures of ammunition, batteries, cables, and links. I'm, I'm still to this day convinced that it was some sort of competition to see how many batteries and cables we could have on one individual at one time. It was, it was just crazy. And it was completely different to, to what I was doing 15 years before in, in Sierra Leone or, or Kosovo um, for that matter. All of this is managed by junior commanders, by corporals and lance corporals. Millions of pounds worth of equipment, life-saving equipment managed by a young corporal and signed for by me. But it's not just kit and equipment that our junior commanders look after and manage. They manage our soldiers too, our most precious resource. When the senior commanders leave, it's the junior NCOs that step in to provide the support our people need. One moment, they're engaging the enemy, giving orders and making life-changing decisions. And the next, they're sat at the end of a cot bed 
dealing with a soldier who's just received a dear John. It is amazing to see, humbling, and they manage situations with very limited training or education. And I want to do more for them, to set them up for success with the right tools. Let me emphasize, we're not broken, we're not broken, I just want to get better. Since we're talking about what our junior commanders do, I will let you peer through a window into my mind and attempt to explain my understanding of the three main groupings that I recognize in our army. The first group, and the one we are focused on today, is that of junior commanders and private soldiers. These are the people who deliver victory on the battlefield for our commanders at the point of contact. The second group are senior NCOs and warrant officers. Well, this group are the bastion of standards, the guardians of our traditions, and they mentor our junior officers. And the third group is our commissioned officers. Well, that's really easy. They command and they always put their soldiers first. Now, I've stated that our junior commanders deliver victory on the battlefield for our commanders. It is our most junior commanders who we trust to make the right decision in a difficult situation. And this is not restricted to the battlefield. It's true for in camp also. Our junior commanders are the first layer of the leadership onion, where the rubber meets the road. And they're the soldier that executes every order. They are the people who make soldiers leave our army and they are the people who make people stay in our army. They really are our vital ground. So what do our junior commanders do? Well, the truth is, I simply don't have enough time to lay it all out, but I will talk about the importance of their leadership in crisis. Conflict has changed, will continue to change, and with the pace of battle now being much faster, we will rely on junior leadership and the decisions made by the strategic corporal to deliver victory on the battlefield for our commanders. CGS said, delegate to the point of discomfort and then delegate once more. And that is exactly what we do to our junior commanders. We afford the mission command so they can make decisions to support and execute the commander's plan. In times of crisis, our junior commanders must feel supported to lead they must feel trusted to make difficult decisions and they must have faith in their command chain. The level of delegation and weight of command is much greater now and plays well into my earlier quote regarding the strategic corporal. Yet the enduring commitment remains the same, whether we are in the trenches of World War I, the beaches of World War II, the fobs of Afghanistan or the complex environment of deep cyber. We will need our junior NCOs to use mission command to deliver victory. So in 1894, Rudyard Kipling said, the strength of the pack is the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack. And I believe that our junior commanders are the wolves. They make things happen. And at the tactical level are the gearing between the senior commanders and the soldier. It's a junior NCO's business to know their people, not just their names, but their circumstances, their family to name a few. It is a difficult relationship and one that requires skill and intelligence to get right. A firm grip but light touch is the way that I've tried to do my business and to be fair it works as long as there is mutual trust and respect. Living with the soldiers as a commander can cause friction and can be tough but the junior NCO is the eyes and the ears for the command chain and critical for soldiers welfare. Okay, another dit, I'm afraid. This time it's about a corporal from, uh, from a signals platoon on, on, a, on one of my Herrick tours. Picture the scene. A full infantry company tooled up. Orders received, waiting for some Chinooks to come and lift us into an operation. And the comms start to go down. I'm sure there's plenty of people who are listening to this who've suffered the same thing. We're not an exercise. Lives are at risk, and this is serious business. The, and the, the choppers are on their way from Bastion. This young corporal was cutting around, fixing faults, swapping kit, and had to tell the company commander 
that the operation had to wait until the problems were fixed. The OC looked at me, he took the advice, and we delayed the pickup slightly to allow the corporal and his team to fix our signals issues. I watched as a CSM, a company start major, the young corporal and his team approach a major and tell him that he couldn't lift until the issue was resolved. That was powerful. And that day I saw exactly what junior leadership was in crisis. Now I feel I must point out here that the kit going down was not his fault and he did fix it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that a corporal delayed an operation that was planned for ages until he was happy we could talk and do what we need to do. I might have been the SART major then, but I couldn't have done what he did. And it was a junior NCO who led us through that crisis. Field Marshal Rommel said, be an example to your men in your duty and in private life. Never spare yourself and let the troops see that you don't in your endurance of fatigue and privation. Always be tactful and well-mannered and teach your subordinates to do the same. Avoid excessive sharpness or harshness of voice, which usually indicates the man has shortcomings of his own to hide. I think this is an important statement which can be applied in any and every situation. We've all come across someone like this. And although we may not have remembered exactly what they said to us, we absolutely will remember how they made us feel. And that is important. In times of crisis, when confusion reigns, it's junior NCOs that hold the team together. They're with the soldiers, they are the soldiers, and they lead the soldiers through crisis. I remember being in an orchard in Afghanistan with rounds coming in from three or four different firing points. I had a soldier shot, and while we were planning the next move, I could see one of my Lance Corporals cutting around and checking on our riflemen. He caught me looking at him, shot me a wink and said, you're right, sir. And I remember giggling to myself and thinking how lucky I was to have a junior NCO like him. He was excellent and the rifleman knew it. His attitude to combat, crisis and confusion was impressive. He simply managed the situation, his people and inspired them with his calm I nature. Didn't get that. With his calm nature. with his calm nature and bravery in the face of danger. Sorry, Siri threw me off. I don't know why, why that was spouting. Um, having a junior commander behave like this in contact was infectious. He was extremely popular with his section and the company because of his nature. A wise man, Major Jim Hadfield, once told me, soldiers will always follow you, Pat, if you order them, but they will work longer, harder and faster for you if they respect you. And he's right. I see it all the time and still remember that conversation from 2010. Now I could spin dits for days and prove time after time the importance of a junior NCO in crisis, but I reckon you have the point, so I'll move on to the legacy. Children growing up aspire to be all blacks. I think it's uh, the heart and soul of New Zealand. I know how much the team meant when I was six years old, getting up in the middle of the night to watch the All Blacks play. When they're in the All Black team, they've been passed on the responsibility of that black jersey with the silver bird. It's their time, it's their time in that jersey, and it's their responsibility to enhance the legacy. Oh, better men make better all blacks. That's really about self-improvement. And it's not only about rugby, it's about life. Young men striving together to produce something that they're proud of. But I think it just encompasses that idea of you can always be better, whether it's off the field or on the field. And if you have that characteristic, then you'll be a great all black. Good people make great teams. And people that uh, aren't very nice 
although they might be superstars, we don't want them. It's about sustaining a culture of success. Week in, week out, year in, year out. The best team in the world, that's our goal. If you recognise how much of an honour it is to put on that the black jersey, then the jersey will let you do things that you wouldn't have thought possible. As always, you're expected to win. any advantage than Harkin? Without question. It's about going into battle with your friends and your mates, standing shoulder to shoulder. It's not only about playing great rugby on the rugby field. It's about how these young men conduct themselves off the pitch. That humbleness, keeping your feet on the ground, realising that you can get better all the time. See the jersey is more intimidating than any opposition. And the key thing for us as past all blacks is to make sure that legacy continues. I'm just very grateful that I got to spend as many years playing you know, for a team that I love. You know, the last hundred years, the All Blacks are the most successful sporting team ever. And long may it continue. Um, so why have I just shown you a video about uh, the New Zealand All Blacks when we're talking about junior leadership uh, through crisis? Well, if you deleted the words All Black throughout the whole of that video and you inserted British Army and or soldier and then listen to it again, I think you'd, you'd, you'd get what I'm trying to achieve here. You know, they talk about being um, the greatest sports team in the world. Um, a high performing team, we are that. They talk about going to combat with their mates, we do that. And they talk about sustaining a culture of success, that's what I want. So there's lots of lessons which, uh, which cross over from, um, certainly from rugby into, into soldiering. Um, but I'd like you to just think how proud they are of their, their black shirt with silver fern and think about the, 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 the image you're seeing on the, on the screen right now. Think how hard if you're a serving soldier or if you have served think how hard you've worked to wear that shirt and just think how proud you should be to wear that shirt that's our black shirt with a silver fern there's only you know 120,000 of us that wear this shirt out of the whole of the uk and we should be very proud but talking about legacy you know there's only one person at any one time with your regimental number in your pit in your job in your unit you have worked hard to wear that MTP shirt and you should be proud. Think of those who may have worn your shirt and rank side before, who may no longer be here, and take pride in setting the next person up for success. And always remember to hand your shirt over in a better place and leave your legacy. Now, Brad Thorne, a New Zealand All Black, said champions do extra. And I absolutely believe that. I've given the army 100% and the army gives me 100% back. And it's a good lesson. If you want 100% out of your people, you need to put 100% in. And that's what good commanders do. And I believe our junior commanders have such a huge impact on our people. And, we, and like we mentioned earlier, every order is eventually executed by a junior NCO with soldiers. And when we talk of leaving a legacy, I think it's important to remember that it's our junior commanders who are the gatekeepers of culture and behaviour. And they have an impact each and every day on our people. Now here's an extract from a, a private soldier on Herrick 9. There was a corporal in my platoon in Sangin that we all used to loathe, a real Jekyll and Hyde. In front of the officers, he was the perfect NCO, always enthusiastic and keen to get the toughest jobs there were. In front of the private soldiers, he was a bully who would belittle you if you didn't do what he wanted and threatened you if you didn't come up to scratch. Whenever we had a break, he would make us sit around him and listen to his stories. We all used to laugh and some even copied the way he dressed, just so that he would not single them out. We weren't scared of him because he was tough, but because of his force of personality. Those that didn't really know him called him a leader. We knew him and hated him. 
In this example, this junior commander is clearly getting it wrong. His people hate him, and that's a strong statement. I want for our junior NCOs to generate and foster a challenge culture where people can feel comfortable with offering and receiving challenge in any situation. A healthy challenge culture can make everybody feel part of the team and generate an environment where we learn from each other, a learning environment. A unit with a good learning environment will become a petri dish of innovation and experimentation, which supports an environment where it is safe to fail. I want for our soldiers to feel comfortable, offering and receiving challenge, confident in their own ability to experiment and safe in the knowledge that if they fail, they will not be punished. Junior NCOs, our junior commanders own this and it starts right at the beginning of a soldier's career. Now I believe that recruits are the most influential, malleable and vulnerable people in our system. They have very limited knowledge of the army and rely on our army, our people to transform them from, from a civilian into a soldier. That's a, that's a difficult journey. We, the army, rely on our training establishments. Our training establish, establishments rely on the training companies. And yet, you guessed it, the companies rely on their junior NCOs to plan and deliver the initial training. Ask any soldier, and I can guarantee they remember their instructor. Ask any officer, and they will remember their color sergeant from Sandhurst. When we talk of leaving a legacy, I don't think it gets much more powerful than that. And it's why I believe that our junior NCOs are the gatekeepers for culture and behavior in our army. They mold our soldiers from day one. They leave them with career long memories, both good and sometimes bad. And ultimately they create the material we work with. In time, the soldiers will become junior NCOs and the cycle continues. Now, one thing our army is good at is suggesting books to read. Two points on this. One, I like reading and it has definitely helped shape the way I do my business. And two, if I, if I had to read every book ever suggested to me, I'd have no time for anything else. So please stop telling me your top book choices. That said, you should all read the book Legacy by James Kerr. Now hear me out. I usually, I usually talk about, um, about the video that I've just shown. And Legacy is about the New Zealand All Blacks, if you've seen. There are 15 chapters, each one a life lesson in leadership. I will touch on a couple, but I want you to think about why these men make the greatest rugby team of all time. It's not due to genetics, training, or supplements. So what is it? Well, I believe it's their culture, how they lead, and how they are led. Let's take a second to touch on, some of a couple of their, to touch on a couple of their points. So go into war with your mates. They always talk about going to the pitch like going to battle with your mates. We do that. We go to war with our mates and look out for each other, work for each other and protect each other. We too are a high performing team. You could be the best rugby player in the world, but if you're not a nice person, we don't want you. Now I want 100% from our soldiers all the time and I would rather have a 70% soldier give me 100% all the time than a 100% soldier giving me 70%. If you're too cool for school and you know everything, then you're in the wrong frame of mind. When you know it all, look to learn something new. Leave your jersey in a better place. The All Blacks talk about how hard they worked up the honor of pulling on their black shirt with a silver fern. Well, you've said it before, but this is our jersey. And we worked hard for this. We should be proud to pull it on every single day. The book Legacy is a powerful read. It made me stop and think, and has generally shaped the way that I do some of my business today. We should all strive to work hard to leave a legacy in our appointment. Remember, use your rank as an opportunity to do more for your people and leave your jersey when you hand it over in a better place. Each player is responsible for the climate and culture of the team and the future of their jersey. We are no different. Every single one of us has a responsibility to do the right thing. We all own the culture of our organization. So Charles Darwin once said, it's not the strongest species that will survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So we'll talk about COVID-19 and how, uh, how it's a great example of, of the quote from Darwin. 
Our junior commanders have absolutely left a legacy during these testing and difficult times. And let me be honest with you. If we met 10 weeks ago and you told me that the global economy would stop overnight, that our population was ordered to stay at home and I couldn't attend my grandmother's funeral, I would have thought you were barking mad. But that is what has happened. Almost without warning, we've had to do the right thing and send our people home. But training has continued. Our young leaders have been driving innovation and change and have been teaching their people through virtual platoons. Now, let me be clear. We normally have a plan on a shelf for everything. We didn't have a plan on the shelf for this. I'm amazed by what I have seen over the last 10 weeks. Our young commanders have felt comfortable enough to try something different, have learnt and developed the virtual platoons, and I'm very grateful to them. But it's not just in our initial training group where we have innovative soldiers, it's all over our army. I've attended online PT sessions, held town halls, question and answer sessions, virtual visits, all with our junior commanders and soldiers. None of it was my idea. So as the commanding officer of Op Corporate in the Falklands said, as you stumble eastwards at night in driving rain and sleet over rock, bog and tussock, and the thumps and flashes of violence intermittently reach across the night sky, you are struck as never before by how profoundly reliant you are upon the cohesion of each team of four, each section of eight, and especially upon their leaders, tough, determined, youthful corporals. So we've, uh, we've discussed um, a few topics now. I'm coming to the, to the end of, uh, of the first phase and then we'll move in some questions. Um, but before we do that, I just wanna to touch on uh, the, the 10 diseases of leadership. Now, I'm, I'm gonna make absolutely no excuses here. Um, I'm gonna read this straight out of the book because I'm, you know, I'm confident that most people haven't read it. And like I say, uh, an active leader will look at these things every day and hold themselves to account. So the 10 diseases of leadership, military, a military historian, Professor Richard Holmes identified 10 diseases of leadership, common bad behaviors that military leaders are prone to slip into. Self-aware leaders will recognize many of these in themselves and short-term lapses can be recovered from relatively easily with minor modifications to behavior. However, if left unchecked, these diseases can become chronic and contribute toward, uh, to towards a very negative leadership environment. The 10 diseases of leadership are as follows. Lack of moral courage. Leaders fail to act and do the right thing even when they know they should. Failure to recognize that opposition can be loyal. Leaders who have an inability to recognize the moral courage required by subordinates to challenge a plan and to give due consideration to their opinions and ideas. Loyal constructive dissent is more valuable than destructive consent. Consent and evade. Leaders who openly agree on a plan which they secretly disagree with and then avoid implementing the plan. There is a need to know and you don't need to know. Information is power. Leaders who try to reinforce their position of authority by needlessly retaining information, reducing subordinates' ability to contribute and act on their own initiative. Don't bother me with the facts. I've already made up my mind. Leaders who lack flexibility and are determined to drive their chosen plan through to completion, regardless of new information or changes in situation. The quest for the 100% solution. Leaders who delay making a decision and acting based on a thirst for more and more information, which may in reality never be complete. And if I'm honest, I do that um, a wee bit, so I'm always trying to check myself with that. Equating the quality of the advice with the rank of the person providing it. Leaders who fail to recognize that wisdom and insights are not intrinsically linked to rank and experience. In some circumstances, due to subordinates or individuals outside of the team might offer the most accurate insight into a situation and have the most timely and considered suggestions but can be ignored by leaders who consider them to be of little value. I'm too busy to win. Leaders who are focused on executing the plan and or routine business that they fail to identify and exploit opportunities for early success. I can do your job too. Leaders who readily descend into their old comfort zones and micromanage subordinate leaders, failing 
to apply mission command and wanting everything done the way they did it. And finally, big man called shadow, leaders who might outwardly appear successful, but are actually responsible for creating a negative leadership climate within their teams. So they are the, the, the 10 diseases of leadership, uh, 10 diseases of leadership. So I mentioned earlier that nobody really, um, I don't come across a lot of people who use this leadership doctrine. I think it's really important. Um, I want to change that behavior. Uh, and I, I really want you to, uh, to, to get hold of this document and have a read through it. Um, and specifically look at pages 82 and 83, which are these 10 diseases of leadership. I think that's where we all need to start. Um, it's generally something I use every day. And, uh, and I think it'd be useful for, for all of us. So that's a, a 46 minute blast uh, to you about um, what's going on on the inside of my mind with regards to, to army uh, junior leadership. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, first say thank you for, for taking the, the time to listen to me and for having the opportunity to talk to you. And now I think uh, the plan is to open the floor for, for 45 minutes where you can um, challenge me on anything I've said, ask me any questions, um, and uh, you know we can have a conversation for, for the next 45 minutes. But like I say, uh, you know, I said up front, please be straight now, shoot straight. Um, you know, and let's uh, let's be completely open and honest with each other. But um, but thanks for listening. Sir W1 Stephen from the uh, Centre for Army Leadership here. Thanks very much for that um, really insightful presentation. A, a look into your world and a look into your views on, on junior leadership. Uh, part of my role here is uh, widening the understanding of army leadership doctrine, so it's really great to hear that you are also championing that, and, and I just echo what you say, it really is a handrail for our, our leadership and a really good read for all our commanders at, and our leaders at any level. Um, we've been inundated with questions, both on uh, the Zoom channels and on direct emails to us before the webinar started. So I'll just kick off with one of the first ones then. The first step onto the ladder is generally considered the hardest for many of our junior leaders. The transition where someone is leading people who were peers the day before can be very tricky. What is your advice to them in making that transition? Hey, that's, um, that, thanks, Adi. That's a really great question, whoever asked that. It's, uh, it's well documented that um, becoming a Lance Corporal is the, is the hardest rank to achieve and the easiest one to lose. Um, you know, thankfully I never lost it, but I did come close. Um, but, uh, but I too suffered and, and, and struggled a wee bit to, to, to make that change. I think what, what I do see um, is a, a battle between popularity versus professionalism. Um, and what I really want to do is to ensure that our our junior commanders, our lance corporals, are empowered to, to, to make decisions um, and to, to live in an environment where they are comfortable to challenge their, their immediate commanders up the chain to, to make things better for their people. And, you know, I, I make absolutely no apologies for saying this, and I say it all the time, that if people use their rank as an opportunity to do more for their people and not as an opportunity for people to do more for them, then um, the transition should be, and absolutely could be, really quite smooth. Because soldiers will, will see you as a, as a junior commander doing more for them. And that can, that can only be a good thing. Um, and just remember, you know, uh, you know, when you become a commander, you, you're commanding your peers. But just remember, you know, friends will, will do what you ask of them. Um, and if they're uh, if they're being difficult and obstructive and uh, and just making your life tough, then then maybe they're not your friends. So uh, it's it, it's a great question. And like I say, use your rank to do more for your people, and your soldiers should follow you into into anything. Great question. Yeah, thanks very much for that. You you, you speak about the challenge culture. Um, we've had a number of questions on that, and this is something I see when I go out to units, and I, I do. Uh, leadership chats with with the different messes and the different cohorts that people really struggle to challenge upwards to have their voice heard do you think that we in the army have a healthy challenge culture and what could we do to improve it so i think we are we are definitely much better than we were when i first joined the army 
you know, when I first joined the army, you were, you were told to do something and you got on with it and you did it and that was it. You didn't even know why you're doing it half the time. Whereas now I think it's really important that we explain the why to our people. Um, you know, I want the army to understand that I don't think that our soldiers are blunt instruments. You know, many years ago, maybe that, that was the case where officers were the commanders and, you know, they, they formulate the plans and soldiers would, would just cut and fodder. And, you know, when I joined the army, people called me a buck she. That means spare. You know, soldiers are not spare. And it's thankfully that sort of behavior and that language is disappearing. But I think our officers are paid to, to command soldiers, but our soldiers are the beating heart. Our, our junior leaders are the beating heart and the backbone of our, of our organization and institution. And any commander who does not stop what they're doing, lift their head up and look at their subordinates in the eye when they're trying to talk to them is not worth their salt. And I will tell anybody that. Um, and people say they find it difficult to, to challenge. As long as it's done respectfully and you're, you're just giving your, uh, your opinion uh, on how something could and, and maybe be done better, any commander should stop and listen to what you're saying. Um, it's easy for me to say as a sergeant major of the army, I get it. And I remember, you know, as a, as a young Lance Corporal, uh, you know, being put in my box for all sorts of stuff. But, but I do it now. You know, I sit with two, three and four star generals and, and, and they want me to, they want me to test their, their plans. They want me to test their thinking and they want me to, to give a soldier's input. And that's what I'd like to think all of our commanders want from our soldiers too. So I think, you know, the advice would be, be uh, just be polite, constructive, and, uh, and absolutely do not be afraid to, uh, to, to challenge um, what's going on. We're all part of one team. We're all pulling in the same direction. And one of the diseases of leadership is equating the, the, the level of the advice with the rank of the individual. And that's a disgusting behavior, which I'm trying to eradicate. Yeah, thanks very much for that, sir. I, I think also um, there, there's an argument that you, you need to evidence base your, your challenge as well. If you've got facts and figures that can back it up, it will be taken a lot more seriously by your commanders. Um, we've got a question coming from Italy from Edward, who's a great supporter of the cow and has followed us for many years. Um, have you ever been given a bad order? And if so, how did you react? Um, yes, I, I have. Um, but I'm just going to, Andy, I'm just going to challenge you just, just very quickly on maybe we should be evidencing and backing up what it is we're trying to say to our command chain. I, I, I disagree with that. I think that somebody's opinion is as important as, um, as any evidence-based paper or whatever it is. If I want a young Lance Corporal to challenge me as a Sergeant Major of the Army, which happened recently in the Falklands, um, I was like, this is exactly what I want you to do. And he, as a young Lance Corporal, adjusted my thinking on a specific subject and I didn't ask him to evidence base it he just made me look at it in a different light so so I would challenge having to evidence base um, an opinion especially for our more junior people um, but moving on um, Edward thank you for your question uh, in Italy um, I have been given a, a bad order um, I've been given a couple of bad orders if, if I'm if I'm brutally honest um, some of them were given when I was a very junior uh, rifleman a junior soldier and um, none of them were illegal um, or, or, or risk, you didn't risk any life or anything like that. But they were, they were bad orders, which I knew were, were destined to fail. And back then at that stage, you know, you can try and say something very quickly, put back in your box. Uh, and we're not in that space now, which is great. Um, but, but later on in my career as well, and I won't give the, I won't give the rank away because that will, that will give the individuals away. But, but later on in my career, um, there, was, uh, there was, you know, a time where I'd, I'd be butting heads with uh, with an individual a lot and um it and i was torn then it's like well i've got a i've got an obligation to look after these people but i've also got an obligation to support these people um and that that left me in a very difficult place for for the very start of my tenure and, until i managed to to work my way through it and settle it down um so ultimately yes i've been given some bad orders as a junior soldier i just got on with it is that the right thing or the wrong thing i don't know that's what i did but now in the army, we're not in that space where we just get on with it. Um, I want people to, to be able to, to say if they think it's a, a bad order and then tease it out as opposed to just being, you know, shouted at and feel that they can't have the why explained to them. So later on in my career, when I was taking bad orders, I was like, hey, no, we need to have a chat about this. And then we worked it through. And that was it was difficult. It was uncomfortable, but it worked. And um, it's not that I got my way. I just got somebody to look at something in a different light, which was a, 
which was a, su a success. But it's a great question, Edward, thank you. What you're talking about there, again, echoes with the, with the challenge culture um, and it, it talks about the relationship between commander and subordinates. There's been a lot of questions focusing on the importance of emotional intelligence and how we can, yes. the importance of that with, uh, with our um, leaders and how we can develop that for our junior commanders. Um, what, what advice would you give and, and how can junior commanders develop their own emotional intelligence? And, and do you know what, Andy, it's, it's really great to hear our people asking these types of questions because it means that my, my thinking isn't, isn't as, as, uh, as off track as I thought it would be. Um, you know, I, I take you back to, to my comments about uh, the RAF, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. You know, it's all about putting platforms in the air or, you know, boats in the water. Um, but for us, it's about putting soldiers on the ground to close with and kill the enemy. That's what it's, it's about, people. Um, and, you know, the RF and the Navy have got people absolutely, and they look after them. But for us, with, with mass, it's, it's about our people closing with and killing the enemy. And, you know, I am really good. I mean, I, there'll probably be some people on this who are thinking, no, he's not. I'm really good at digging holes, and I'm really good at shooting targets. But nobody has really sat me down and shown me how to how to get the very best out of my soft skills with, with people. You know, the, the techniques of, you know, the emotional intelligence that, that, that our people are quite rightly talking about. And what I want to do is I want to train our people in that. I want people to be trained um, in, you know, so I'm an infantry soldier, so I should be trained in infantry tactics and, and stuff. But then also I should be trained collectively with, with other cat badges on, on how to get the best out of people. Because, um, you know, like I said up front, people are our most valuable resource. We need to learn and know how to use them. Now, we have got some things in place with ALDP, CLM, you know, and, and our officers go through uh, some, some great training. But I want more. And I want more for our soldiers. And I want them to develop um, so they can identify problems in themselves, in others, to effectively signpost, to... Um, to, to really get into the weeds so that when you say to somebody in the morning, hey, you're all right, you actually mean, no, are you all right? As opposed to a throwaway comment that used to be said 20 years ago. So the emotional intelligence piece is, hard, it's, is, is well up on my radar. And, um, you know, I firmly believe that we should be trained in that as, um, separately to our, um, our trade training. And I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense, sir. And it's, uh, it's really reassuring to hear um, you've mentioned there uh, the uh, ALDP, the replacement for CLM. We've had a number of questions on that, and one from uh, Major Joseph Petty. I I'll read it verbatim, but he says, uh, Army Sergeant Major, I am an OC of an ALDP training squadron. Whilst I recognise the importance of formalising a generic set of leadership training objectives to replace CLM, I have a concern that ALDP may erode branch or regimental identity. I am aware that there is a future aspiration to establish a soldier leadership center that will be cat badge agnostic and open to all. Do you agree that there is continued benefit in cat badges training their own personnel? The level of training, for example, basic close combat skills required for the infantry or the armored corps differs from other cat badges who will have less experiences. Cat badge flavor remains important and should be protected. So really they're looking at ALDP, um, whether it should be cat badge uh, agnostic or whether um, cat badges should have flexibility in the training objectives, the establishment of a, a leadership centre, and then whether uh, cat badge flavour remains important and should be protected. Okay, um, some, uh, some good questions there. Um, and I'll, I'll tackle them in, in, uh, in order. I'll go with, um, I'll start with the ALDP. Listen, so ALDP is better than CLM. Uh, and that's, that's clear cut. It is much better than CLM. Um, so that's a, a step in the right direction. The, uh, the tribalism that we have in our army is one of our greatest strengths. But from where I sit now, I also see it, it can be a, it can be a weakness as well. And the reason I say that is um, absolutely agree with armor corps, um, infantry have a, a, a different skill set to um, I don't know, another, another branch of the army, another core in the army. But my, I would challenge the fact um, that ALDP could and should be done, um, tr you know, tribally. Because when do you start to look around and see what else is in our team? 
when when do you start to build that network and i mean if you look at officers they go to sandhurst and and they're just all mixed together and by the time they start their military career as a as a commissioned officer they've got a network across the whole of the army i hadn't left and been posted anywhere outside of outside of the infantry until i was a color sergeant instructor at sandhurst and you know it might sound corny but my my life changed off the back of the sandhurst card and then doing two years there because it just it ripped the blinkers off me and I understood what else was out there in the army, that there were some, you know, there were some fantastic people from, from different cat badges, all working, you know, to, to the same, the same problems, um, all pulling in the same direction. And when I went back to my battalion, I could leverage that network for my company commander. I could leverage that network for my CO. Um, and I still use my Sanders network today. And if I'd have remained in, in uh, you know, tribal in, in the rifles fold, and I didn't manage to, to look elsewhere, then I would have denied myself a huge friend base, um, loads of experience, and the ability to reach into different parts of the army, which I think is hugely important. So we're all one team. Um, so I absolutely agree that we should be doing um, soft skills, emotional intelligence, leadership training, all of that, I think, should be done cat badge agnostic because we've all got something to learn from somebody else. And moving outside of our own our own comfort zone of, our, of our, our tribal environment will allow us to be pushed into a, into a different environment and allow us to learn something, something different. Um, I absolutely agree that the, the tactical training for the employment of that cat badge needs to be done with that cat badge. So if you're going to train infantry, do it with the infantry. If you're going to train leadership and soft skills, do it collectively so you can learn from each other different opinions and do, and, and do it whilst you're building your network. And th there, is, um, there is talk of, you know, the Soldier Academy and, and Leadership Academy and, and, and stuff like that. And I'm pushing that really, really hard because I think it's super important. I've not seen anybody really outside of, of the infantry until I, went to, uh, and, until I went to Iraq. And by then I was, a, you know, I, was a, I was a corporal and, you know, I only saw some engineers and stuff like that, but I didn't really work with them properly until I went to, to Sandhurst. And I want to start that much, much earlier on. Yeah, thanks for that, sir. Um, I, I think the, the development of a, a leadership school uh, cross army, pan army w w would be fantastic. And uh, I echo that the ALDP being cat badge agnostic, there, there are massive benefits in, in learning from each other. And we should be a learning organization. We, we should take that forward every day. Um, we've had a, a few questions from uh, the reserve contingent and, and one of them that resonates and that has been liked a lot is how do you think we can develop junior le leadership within the reserve space? Uh, so, uh, so, you know, we are all one team. Reservists, regulars, you know, we're all one team. So clearly there are some challenges with, um, with leadership training with reservists because you know, of um, other employment, um, geography, et cetera. But I think ultimately the way to get after that will be with, um, with online digital leadership training. So I did a lot of that um, when I was away working with the Americans um, and they showed me a, a completely new way of, of doing business with regards to education um, and leadership training. So you don't need to have your belt kit and a helmet on to, to go and do training with, you know, regards to leadership. Uh, you just need to be able to, to sit down and, and read and, and explore and, and, and develop mentally as well. So I think, you know, there are, there is lots of work going on and I'm pushing it really hard. Everything to do with soldier education, I'm passionate about. Anything to educate our junior NCOs, I'm passionate about. Um, and all the way through to our W01s as well, we're, we're changing that course too. Um, I, but it's, you know, it all takes time. And just know that the, the reserves have um, a command sergeant major, um, DCFA Sergeant Major, who sits with with me um, at all of our meetings, I um, mean, has a direct feed into me. So, um, anything reserve focused, if if he feels we need to do more, he sends it straight into me, um, and I communicate with him about reserve issues. So, please don't feel that you know reserves are being left out in the cold. We're all one team. We're all in the army, and uh, you know we'll all move forward together. Um, it, it's just going to take time to make sure that we we get everything tied up and, and sorted out. Thanks for that, sir. We've had a question here from uh, Liam Beach. 
and it's uh, again been liked by many people and it's, it's about the current crisis and the opportunities that are afforded to some junior NCOs in support in the, uh, the COVID response force um, and others that aren't, others that are, are at home and are almost losing out on a, a large chunk of their reporting period and how it's going to negatively affect them. Um, that their, their counterparts are out there doing the business on the front line, so to speak, and they're back at home and potentially missing out on, on key reporting time where, where they're looking at promoting. What advice would you give them? So um, I, I think up front what I'd say is that every single soldier that we have in the army right now is um, playing their part and has, has, uh, has a responsibility to do what the nation needs us to do right now. So we have some people who are, who are on a, a COVID support force, and I went to go and visit some in Gloucester last week, um, which are you know, assisting the nation with testing. But anybody else who is at home and is not doing that is assisting the nation by being at home and by playing by the rules. We've got, there is certainly not one size fits all here. So I, I think, you know, what I say is don't worry about it. This is something that has been discussed. And that's why I start out with, we are all doing our bit here. And, you know, we should all be very proud as to what we're doing and how we're doing it. Whether you're testing people in Gloucester or in one of the other 92 sites, whether you're um, working in one of the, uh, when the RPOX, you work in one of the hospitals, whatever it is you're doing, when all this is over and COVID is gone, whenever that is, we all need to look in the mirror and think, what did we do to support our country at this time of national crisis? And if it's, I stayed at home, I stayed resilient, responsive and ready, because that's what CGS has asked me to do. Or if I got charged for a block party, or if I got arrested, or I got a penalty, a fixed penalty notice for breaking the rules, then they'd have to live with that. So um, it's, it's, um, it's a live issue. Uh, so not, it's not an issue. It's, uh, it's something that has been discussed to ensure that it doesn't become an issue. Because if you're at home, and you're doing what you should be doing, then you are playing your part um, at, at this time of national crisis. So I think to summarise that, don't worry about it. Keep doing what you're doing. Look after yourselves, your family, and, uh, and abide by the government guidelines. And the system, um, I'm sure, will, uh, will look after you. So you've spoken now about the variety of tasks that our people are involved in. We at the Centre for Army Leadership at the moment are looking at the lessons that we can learn through this crisis and how it can change the future of how we uh, do leadership and, and train our leaders. Um, what lessons have you seen or what examples have you seen of great leadership when you've been visiting our, our, our troops that are engaged at the moment in the current crisis and support? And what do you, how do you think this will change the way that we conduct operations in the future? So the uh, visiting COVID, COVID facing sites um, are, has been has been few and far between, and that's because you know I don't want to be going around the army stroking my own ego and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to tip up and see what you're up to. It's you know, and become a super spreader. It's not about that. It's uh, so I've I've had a couple of very short, very small visits where I've managed to to go and see the great stuff that that our people are doing. Um, and I'll just touch on Charlie Company, uh, uh, one Royal Welsh who I spoke to uh, last week in Gloucester. And, you know, I was astonished with what I saw down there. You know, we've got a, an infantry battalion, infantry focused, you know, ground close combat, close with and kill the enemy. And they just pivot, they turn, and then they're dressed in full PPE in the scorching sun, stood there delivering tests for, for, for the general public, who only go to see them when they're concerned about their own health and that of their families. And they come and see us, the army, to, to get tested and for us to support them. So I think, you know, one of the lessons I've, I've learned, and I've never seen it before, you know, I've, I've seen the, the diversity and the, the ability to, you know, to change and the flexibility of our soldiers. I've seen that before, but just not at this level. We've got people who are doing things which they never ever thought they'd do. They never join the army to do some of the stuff they're doing. Um, and, and they're just getting on with it. And they're doing a fabulous job, you know, and it's like, um, it's like the, uh, you know, you know, it's the, the, the great stuff that our NHS are doing, you know, they are doing an unbelievable job in what they're doing too. Um, and, you know, I just want to pay credit to our, to our soldiers who are doing what they're doing, wherever they are, because we all have a part to play and we all have a responsibility to, to keep this virus down. Um, 
me personally, some, some of the things that I've changed, um, I have never spoken to so many people. So uh, last night I had a, a live Instagram with, uh, with some cadets for an hour. Um, earlier in the day, I spoke to, to nearly 300 of the RSMs. Last night at 10 o'clock, I spoke to the, um, I had a meeting with the Army Sergeant Majors from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, and America. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking to so many more people now, so much more frequently, because I haven't got to get up at 4 a.m. To, to get on a plane and go and fly somewhere. I literally just, just pick, up the, pick up the telephone or the computer, wherever I am, and, and, and do it virtually. Now, you can never replace, um, you know, that, that face-to-face, you know, contact. Um, so you can pick up those non-verbal cues. But this is actually a very, very good second. And I'm seeing more people now than, than I've ever seen. So if, if I'm going to take anything forward, and one thing I'd... I'd urge and advise all of our, our commanders to do, all of our soldiers to do, is, um, is to, to get connected and remain connected and speak to, speak to your people as often as you can. And I'd say the gold solution is, um, is, a, is a FaceTime call, is a video call, whether that's a meeting or whether that's you're just checking up on your team. It's a video call so you can see how they are and they can see that, how you are. Um, and then I think the silver standard would be a voice call when video is not achievable. And then the bronze, I'd say, would be a text message. But absolutely, being connected, staying connected, and looking after your people um, is, uh, is one of the things I'll definitely take forward. Fantastic, thanks for that. Um, we've already spoken a, a, about uh, ALDP replacing CLM, and we've spoken about some of the development courses. Do you think we're, we're getting it right? Is the balance of leadership development correct, or are we still focused too much on command? Hey, listen, so um, that, that's another great question. And uh, I think we are, we are definitely getting it right. We're definitely getting better. Um, but, you know, like I said earlier, you know, once, you, uh, once you're good at what you do, you know, the All Blacks will say, well, go and find the gap. You know, f- find what else you can do. Find how you can make what's, what's brilliant even better. And that's, that's what I think we need to do. And that's why I'm championing and I'm pushing so hard for... Uh, for, for a school for our, for our soldiers and NCOs so we can learn our um, you know our soft skills our emotional intelligence we can develop that and really turn that into a, into a skill and a tool and a weapon you know to to, to look after our people um, I think uh, you know we have we are you know one of the greatest armies in the world and that's not by accident we are very very good at what we do our people are very very good at what they do um, but I want to I want to find a gap and I want to get better. So we are definitely marching in, in, in the right direction. And I'll be completely open and honest, like I said up front, you know, most of my education that I've done in the army, my, my CLM and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm sure some people will agree and some people will disagree, but I don't really remember any of it. And that's what I want to change. I want our junior, our junior commanders, our corporals, our sergeants, our color sergeants, our W2s, our W1s to go through an educational gateway to get something from it, both um, with accreditation and also mentally when they walk away. I want them to, to learn at these different levels. And, and of course, what that allows CGS to do is as the, you know, the, the commander of the whole of the army is to reach down and know what, what is the level of emotional intelligence for um, a sergeant in, um, in an infantry battalion and knows that it's the same when it's uh, a sergeant in an engineer unit or whatever it is. So we've got some parity, just like the officers have, ICSE, ACSE, HSC. You know, they all, they all go through these gateways to, to, to train and develop them. Well, I want the same for our soldiers. So I think the answer, Andy, is um, we are getting better. Um, we are certainly not there yet. And uh, I'm like a dog with a burst ball with this, and I, I'm not letting this go. And uh, I'll, I'll continue to push to make sure that we can, we can continue to improve. But remember, we're not broken. We are absolutely not broken. I just want to get better. Yeah, fantastic. It sounds promising. Um, we've had one come in about the recent announcements for accelerated promotion and the change in policy that's now going to be Pan Army. Under Castle, what other initiatives are there to reward our, our junior leaders that are operating at the top of their game? Uh, okay, so, well, it's good that people are hearing about the accelerated promotion. Um, and please don't glaze over. But I, I put a video out last weekend on uh, on Defence Connect about that. 
And, you know, out of the 80 odd thousand people that are on the Fence Connect, I think something like 3000 people had seen it. Um, so I will put stuff on there for DPERS and, uh, and DCGS every week to ensure that our soldiers have the, you know, the up to date um, official line on, on what's going on, because, you know, that I'll never give orders on social media. Um, I'll never release anything like that on social media. I'll, I'll always only ever do it from behind a firewall on the Fence Connect so you know that it's genuine. Um, that there are so I'm the soldier who sits on um, on on the castle board along with uh, Bombardier Duncan, um, and uh, and we reach out into into units and grab people for opinions and stuff all the time. It's um, it's an exciting once in a generation opportunity to adjust and change the way that we do our business. And you'll have seen me spouting in Soldier Magazine months ago talking about you know why somebody can't be a gunner and then go and train to be a paramedic and then and then go and do something else as well because. I think our people want to move around and they want to sample different things. So they come into the army, they do a few years and then they leave to go and do something else. Well, I want them to be able to do that in the army. And there's some very, very bright, powerful people working. And it's not me. There's some very bright, powerful people, generals who are working on this program for CGS, who is, um, who is really keen to make this work. So, you know, and I, I go back to, you know, I said earlier, you know, one of the quotes was, you know, doing things the way they've always done it. That's one of the diseases of leadership. We don't need to do that. Once you get good, look for the gap and get better. And that's what we're trying to do. And it's all about improving things for our people. The specifics, what I don't want to do now is tell you what is being worked through. Um, what, what I will say to you is keep an eye out for, um, you know, I'd say, yeah, look, look out for the, um, the army briefing notes and the DINs, but you're not going to do that. Um, I would say, if you want the, the quick answer to this, look on Defence Connect under the, the Project Castle um, or Programme Castle page uh, and also look out for, for my announcements on, on what's happening. That is the only place to stay abreast of what is a, a once-in-a-generation once opportunity to change the way that the army um, looks and, and smells. And it's an unbelievable project. It's huge. Um, and so many different connections. So, you know, we had the the Air Corps recently do some stuff with uh, with boarding, uh, electronic boardings, and um, you know the um, the Army Talent Framework is starting to come in. There's all sorts of of great initiatives that are coming in, and, and loads of good information platforms which are which are being laid on top of it as well. Um, but there's no point in in talking about any of that yet until it's uh, uh, until it's official and and, and rolled out properly. Thanks for that. We've probably got time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so the penultimate question, what can our senior leaders learn from our junior leaders? Oh, wow. They, they, honestly, they can learn a, a huge amount, and they do. And, and they learn through, through people like, uh, like me, through um, Sergeant Major Carney, through all of the command Sergeant Majors. They learn from us all the time. Because, you know, when I was the RSM of a battalion, I'm at three rifles. All I, all I cared about was my rifleman. And if I'm brutally honest, I don't even know what division I was in. But all I cared about was my rifleman. And, you know, some people say, well, that's the way it should be. Um, some people say, well, no, you should be looking up and out as well. Uh, you know, maybe there's a balance, in, you know, for, for both. But I wasn't really in that space. Um, and there was no Army Sergeant Major. Uh, there was no Command Sergeant Major. So I couldn't feed anything from the battalion level into another soldier into the three and the four star space. Whereas now we can. And that's why I do two or three hours of social media every day, speaking to soldiers about stuff at, 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 the, at the coalface. Because there's no point in having an Army Sergeant Major or a Command Sergeant Major for Field Army, 1 Div, 3 Div, 6 Div, any of them. There's just no point unless soldiers start using us. Um, and they are now, which is great. And I will take stuff from soldiers and I will take that through. So when, when people turn around and say, hey, um, you know, I sit on a program board um, for a, a program that's coming in. The way it works is I will speak to the two star generals or I will speak to whoever is the project lead for those those projects. They, they will come and ask me to, to look at some stuff and see what the soldier input would be um, to test things through me, to get me to red team their, their thinking because they genuinely care what soldiers think. And I, I, I cannot um, emphasize enough. The, the workload that these people are under, it is absolutely brutal. Um, and they are, they are working hard to, to keep the army on point and to, to, stay, to stay up to speed. Um, and it's people like me that take information from our soldiers that, that feed it in. So they can learn a great deal. CGS is, is one of the most um, inspirational leaders I've ever worked with. 
yet you know when when he was a platoon commander in the Irish Guards that was many many years ago and well before I joined the army so if he wants to know what's going on now in in a in a, in a guards battalion he'll rely on on sensors from the army to uh to, to know exactly what's going on at that level because he's you know working up strategic and out and it's the same for for all of the generals so that the, you know the answer is generals can and do and will continue to learn from our soldiers um through the the medium of, of command sergeant majors and it's proving really powerful so keep using us and just time for one last question our final question then if you could turn back time to when you were a young lance corporal what would you have done differently and why oh so that's uh yeah that's a, a, I thought i got away with that um what would i do so i generally I, I think i just wish that i knew then what i know now um and that you know some of the stuff that that i put up with as a as a young lance corporal but the army was very different different then um i just i just wouldn't have put up with um you know i wish that we had a challenge culture where someone you know a, a soldier was telling me hey if you know if if you've got an idea then raise it and someone will listen to you um and i'd also you know i wish the education um opportunities were there as well you know we've got young soldiers now on degree programs we've got people you know with all sorts of accreditations i mean it's just it's fantastic so i think i would uh, i'd probably if i was a lance corporal now i wouldn't be living to the next paycheck i wouldn't be living um for the weekend i'd be using the army and all of its opportunities um to, to get the very best out of me to stretch myself to be to be something that i never thought i'd be able to achieve um I've been very lucky operationally. I've been been all over the place. I've been kept very very busy, and clearly I've had a I've had a blessed career. Um, but I would absolutely identify the huge array of um, of opportunities that our army offers. You know, our soldiers. I'd I'd sniff those out. I'd be taking them, and I'd be using it all the time to 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 build my portfolio and to, to keep developing myself uh, mentally um, for for later on in my career. Sir, so thank you very much for that. That, that concludes the q and I'd just like to say thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks for asking the questions. It's really reassuring to, to hear your passion, your commitment to improving the life and the experience for our soldiers and certainly for our junior leaders and, and really inspiring to hear that things are changing under Castle and you've really got a grip and like you said, like a, like a dog with a ball. Um, you, you're not going to let this go and you're going to develop it. For, from us, from the Centre for Army Leadership, that's really reassuring um, that it's going in the right direction. So thank you very much for uh, taking your time today. Andy, that, that's great, mate. And, you know, thank you to everyone who, who, who listened and thanks for inviting me along. And, and I'd just like to finish my three messages if I can. Just remember that your rank is an opportunity to do more for your people, not an opportunity for you um, to have people do more for you. Um, that our soldiers do not make mistakes on purpose. Um, if, if they're not performing, scratch under the skin and find out what's going on and, and try and coach, mentor, lead them through. But there is a difference between reckless behaviour and a mistake. So just identify the difference. Um, and finally, leave a legacy. You know, what you're doing is incredibly important. There's only 120,000 or so people who wear the shirt you wear. You've worked hard to wear it. Think about the people who wore your shirt, shirt before who may no longer be here. And think about those who you need to set up for success as you move on and leave a legacy and hand your jersey over in a better place. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, good luck to, uh, to, to you, your families uh, and your teammates at, at this difficult time. And please remember to remain ready, resilient and responsive um, as, we, uh, as we start to, to move back into the workplace in, in, the, in, the, in the future. But, um, but thanks very much and stay well. Andy, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Sir, thank you. Um, I think we've reached a, a new and a slightly different demographic in the audience today. We've probably attracted a lot more junior NCOs. So I just want to really make them aware of the cow, the, the Centre for Army Leadership. We are here for you. We are, we are trying to champion Army leadership throughout our organisation. Um, you can sign up to our distribution list. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter. We, we host regular webinars at the moment and then speaker events um, once lockdown is lifted. 
um, please get involved. Join the conversation. We're here to support you and represent you throughout the army. Um, we have an activist network for those of, the, the, those of you that really want to get involved, want to get bespoke training, want to support the cow, and want to really drive leadership and leadership development within your own units. Um, we've got some exciting speakers lined up for the future. Our next one is uh, General Pope, who was the former DCGS. Um, we're looking at running that in about two weeks' time. But please look out, follow us on all our social media platforms, um, and get involved and sign up to our distribution list so, so you can have contact with us and we can continue to support you in the best way possible. Thank you very much.